Our reading today comes from Luke 24, verse 13 to 35. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing them. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some woman from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, Stay the night with us, since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. At that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were back on their way to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. So this um, story of Jesus meeting with his disciples on the road to Emmaus is quite a famous story. Um, it's a story of people missing Jesus right in front of them. So it is possible to be on the road with Jesus and not actually realize it. And I suppose we can kind of relate to this. Have you ever been so focused on something that you missed what was going on around you? Have you turned your attention so much to one thing that it distracted you from seeing what else was there? I remember many years ago when we were in Kruger Park, I was looking through my binoculars at a pair of saddle built stalks, like scrolling around this waterhole trying to find something to eat. And I spent a good five minutes just looking at these saddle built stalks wading through the water. So much so that I completely missed the pride of lions drinking the water just behind the saddle of stalks. I was so focused through my binoculars on the birds that I missed the king of the jungle. I suppose you can relate to that. Or have you ever been like looking for something? You've been so panicked or in such a big hurry to try and find it. Maybe your phone or your car keys or the TV remote or your glasses. You're in such a fuss and a muddle about trying to find it that you miss seeing it right in front of you. There's that saying, hey, if it were a snake, it would reach out and bite you. It's easy to be so focused on something else that we miss what is right in front of us. And that's what happens in Luke chapter 24. These two disciples are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus just down the road. Jesus appears and walks with them, but they don't recognize that it's Jesus. Maybe you find it hard to believe it. If these were disciples who lived with him, who heard him speak, who watched him live out his life, how could they not see that it was Jesus? They talk with them about everything that has happened in Jerusalem. 
about how Jesus died, even about the rumors of the resurrection that they've heard from some of the other believers. They talk about how they had belief that he was going to be the Messiah, the one who would save them and redeem all of Israel. And they even share with the stranger on the road with them how it feels like their hopes have been dashed, their fear and their desperation now that he is gone. This is such a gripping and interesting story for us because it is in many ways our own story. We know what this is like. We know what it's like to have your hope and your desire seemingly smashed by events that we face up to. We know what it's like to try and find a way to move on when our dreams have been crushed, when life doesn't go according to the plan that we set. The story highlights then the living hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. How what we feel doesn't have to be the reality we live in. On that first Easter Sunday, when it felt like living hope was all but snuffed out, these two disciples find Jesus on that road to Emmaus. They had left Jerusalem for Emmaus, feeling demoralized and confused. The events of Good Friday were very fresh in their minds. We can understand some of that confusion that they felt, some of those feelings of being lost and without hope. You know, the master that they loved was now gone. The person that they had followed and put all their energy of their life into had been horribly murdered by the Romans. And death by crucifixion was a horrific thing to witness. The victim was made a public spectacle, exposed to jeers of all who passed by. The disciples would have felt the pain as Jesus was mocked and tortured and in pain. Especially because just a week before that, on Palm Sunday, he was celebrated as the new coming king. They acknowledged that there was something about it. They hailed their master as their long-awaited deliverer their Messiah. But now he lay dead and sealed in a tomb. Their hopes were dashed, their dream was over, and they felt like they were lost in a very scary world. The followers of Jesus were without a leader, and they were falling apart pretty quickly. Some of them abandoned him as he was arrested. Some betrayed him or denied him. Not many of them were even left at the foot of the cross as he took his last breath. These two were on their way home, going back to Emmaus, away from Jerusalem, where it all happened, but away from their disciple friends. There are these reports that the tomb of Jesus is empty, but this only confused the disciples even more. It didn't give them hope or life. Their entire world had come apart. And so these two downhearted disciples kind of sum up the emotion of the day when they say, we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Human hope is a fragile thing. And when it withers, it's very difficult to revive. I want you to think about the time that you felt most hopeless and helpless in your life. Those times when you felt like there was simply no way out. No matter what you tried, there was nothing you could do to make the situation any better. You know, maybe it it came along with some words like, there's nothing more they can do for me. The cancer has spread too far. My partner has left me for someone else and I don't know why. I've tried so hard to give up smoking or to give up drinking, but I just can't shake the habit. I feel so stuck in my job. I really hate it, but my family needs the income, so I've got to find a way to keep going. I've given up. I don't believe that things will ever change with that relationship, in that situation, with this problem that I'm facing. What difference can we make? We are so small and the problems are so big. I mean, have you ever heard yourself or someone you love say those kinds of words? 
So if you have, then you have a bit of an idea of what those two disciples going to Emmaus were feeling and experiencing on that day. That's what they were grappling with. Those are the emotions. We had hoped, but now our hope is gone. What they may have been saying is, we expected so much, but now we don't expect it anymore. Sometimes we feel the exact same way. We once had hope, but now it is gone. But praise God, that's not the end of the story. In fact, that's merely just the beginning. Because as these travelers make their way to Emmaus, a stranger comes alongside them. And they didn't know it yet, but this was going to be one of the most amazing walks in all of history. We know that that stranger is the risen, resurrected Jesus. But somehow they don't recognize him. And I, I wonder why. Luke says that they were kept from recognizing him. But maybe they were too preoccupied to look him in the eye. Maybe they didn't care. Or maybe all the trauma that they had been through didn't allow them to see who it really was. What difference did it make to them anyway about who was walking with them? They were grieving this great loss in their lives, the death of their hope that they were hoping in. And along comes this chatty stranger who seemingly has no idea about what's been happening in Jerusalem. The stranger asked him, well, what's going on? And he listened as they poured out their hearts to him. Jesus doesn't uh, dumb them down, but rather in consideration of their brokenness, of how they're feeling, he listens. He walks with them on their journey. He takes in everything that they have to say. But then he begins to fill their hearts with the promises of Scripture. He unlocks God's Word and shows them how the Messiah was meant to go through all these kinds of evils. How it was predicted that he would suffer. How it was mentioned in the Old Testament that he would have to die. But I wonder... For us, could it be that when we are feeling low, when we are feeling downcast, when we feel lost and misdirected in this life, could it be that Jesus joins us on our journey, that he spends time with us, that he speaks to us, that he listens to us, but we don't realize it? You see, Jesus enters their pain. He acquaints himself with everything that they are going through. He allows them to share their story of disappointment. And as they tell the stranger what they thought Jesus was all about, Jesus unpacks for them the mystery of God's salvation. He fills their hearts with lessons of faith and of hope. He traces all the way through the Old Testament how this was part of God's plan all along, from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob, how it's mentioned in Moses and the prophets, how Jesus... I mean, how God saving his people from Egypt, the Exodus, is a pointer to what Jesus is doing on the cross. He speaks about the suffering servant of Isaiah, the servant of God who was going to suffer much for his people. The stranger asks them, didn't the Christ have to suffer these things? So it's a 10 mile, I mean, a 10 kilometer journey, 7 mile journey. It might take you about 2 hours to walk it. I imagine that that two-hour journey would have felt like 15 minutes as the stranger unpacked all of this information for them. They were so wrapped up in the conversation that they didn't recognize that it was Jesus speaking to them. Then Luke has this great way of writing. He says, as they approached the village, Jesus made it look like he was going farther. They invite him to come in. Because it was evening, it was getting dark, it's dangerous to travel in the dark. And it's always a good thing to show hospitality. They didn't have to ask Jesus to stay, but they did. Hadn't their hearts been strangely warmed while they were walking? Didn't they enjoy the conversation that they had with this man? So they invited him. They set a table for three people. 
There's a loaf of bread on the table. And the stranger reaches over to the bread, picks it up, and as he breaks it and hands it out to them, it all clicks. They recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. When he took the bread and gave thanks and passed it to them, it made them remember that they had seen that before. They realized it was Jesus. And in that same instant, he was gone. Can you imagine those two friends standing next to each other, asking in amazement, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They suddenly realized that Jesus was alive, that death had been defeated. And it says that immediately, even though it was getting dark, those two disciples head back to Jerusalem. They head back to that 10 kilometer journey. Although this time I'm sure they were running. Maybe the fastest time that distance has ever been run. They retrace their steps to Jerusalem to share the good news. That simple two hour walk in the morning had become a life transforming experience. Now their hearts that were once downcast and sad are filled with hope and passion. They want to share with everyone they meet what they have seen and heard and experienced in Jesus. They were on a mission. Their hearts were burning. They were excited. Everything changed. They had good news to share. They couldn't keep it to themselves. They had meaning and purpose again. All because Jesus was alive. I love the story because... It's an instant transformation. Often when those big changes of mindset and heart come about, it's only because of God working in someone's life. So it's exciting to read that story. But I think for me what's most powerful about it is what they experience in person and physically is what we experience often emotionally and spiritually. We move from hopelessness to hope, from sadness to joy, whenever we encounter Jesus in a real way. And so the, the key is to learn to recognize that we are on the road with Jesus in this life. And to recognize that He is with us even when we don't at first realize it. And so I think there are three good things to hold on to. Three lessons that we can learn to help us see Jesus in the midst of our everyday lives better. And so the first one, I think, is simply to expect to see Him. Believe that He actually wants to speak to you. Trust that He wants to be involved in your life. You know, so often we live with this doubt saying, no, but will God really speak to me? Is that verse really for me and what I'm going through? Or is it just per chance? Is it coincidence? I'm not sure God would be interested in dealing with that. Sometimes we've got to just accept that those verses that people send us, the, the part of the message that stands out to you on a Sunday in church, that intuition, that gut feeling that seems to come from God, probably is from God. It can be so easy to miss Jesus in the midst of our busy everyday lives. We can pray and ask Him to reveal Himself to us. And then I think we've got to expect Him to speak. We've got to have a listening ear and a certain expectation of heart. Part of the reason those first disciples missed Jesus is they didn't expect it, it to be Him who was with them. There's something there. Expect Jesus to speak to you. If He loves you like He says He does, if He is with you like His Word promises, then surely... He wants to speak to you and reveal himself to you. Expect it, believe it. The second thing worth noticing is Jesus spends that entire 10 kilometer journey unpacking everything that the Old Testament says about him. Back then they didn't have a New Testament. My Old Testament lecturer always said, now we get to read the Bible that Jesus read. But the truth is the same. Old Testament, New Testament is the only way 
we get to encounter the story of Jesus. And there is no substitute for spending time in the Word. There is no way to be a Christian who is connected to Jesus without involving the Word of God in your life. And we know this, but sometimes we fall out of the habit of doing this. I came across a book title by a pastor, Dr. David Murray. His book is called Jesus on Every Page. It's a book that tells Christians about how to read the Bible for all that it's worth, to share the message that Jesus has for you on every single page of Scripture. There is no substitute for time in the Word. Jesus unpacks the Bible for those travelers, shows them where it is and what it says about it. If you want to know Jesus more, we've got to spend time in the Word. I like to remind people that it's easier than ever to read the Bible. If there's a part you don't understand, you can Google what doesn't make sense. But you can also speak to Christian friends or your pastor who would love to tell you what's going on. But there are audio Bibles that can read the Bible out to you while you are driving. There are daily devotionals that you can get on your phone or email to your email address. There are faithful daily livings at the back of the church that you can grab. Or you could just simply open up the Bible and read. Read a whole book at a time. Read John, one of the Gospels. Move on to Acts. There's no substitute for meeting with Jesus in His Word. And then the third thing is to find Jesus in the life of the church. For me, it's not surprising that Jesus is recognized in the breaking of the bread. Whenever we partake in these traditions of the church, we do them because that are, those are opportunities to experience Jesus. So if you're not partaking in the life of the church, you are missing out opportunities to connect with Jesus. You can hear Him speak to you during a service on Sunday, in a song that you sing, or a prayer that you pray, or a message that is delivered. You can meet with Jesus as we celebrate Holy Communion once a month. But you can also meet with them at a Bible study that the church holds, or when we have a, a fellowship day, or when we uh, offer our time to serve at a church fundraiser next week, Saturday. That fellowship, that time with other Christians is good for our hearts. It's good for our souls. We encounter Jesus in the life of the church. It's possible, this story teaches us, that it is possible to be with Jesus and yet not realize it. That's why we need each other, companions on the journey. We need to walk the road of Christianity with each other and help each other see Jesus in our lives. That's why we need scripture and we need to spend time in the Word. That's why we need to come to church and celebrate Holy Communion. That's why we need those spiritual practices of prayer and silence and fasting, and there are many, many others, because it is so easy to miss it. But when you realize that He is there, when you recognize His love and His presence with you, your mood, your demeanor, your hopefulness all changes. You know, for those first disciples, nothing about their physical situation changed. Rome was still in control and still anti-Jesus and all his followers. The Jewish leaders still wanted to crush the Jesus movement. Life was still hard and faced with immense challenges. But because Jesus was alive, the way they approached those things would forever be different. And it is the same for us. Life is hard. There are times when life is real difficult. But we can face up to those challenges differently because Jesus is alive and His hope can be alive with us too. Because that hope has a powerful effect on human lives. It transforms ordinary people like those Emmaus disciples, like me and like you, into passionate witnesses for God and His life. Into people who live with joy because Jesus is alive into people who live with hope despite their circumstances because we know about the power of Jesus. And so as we journey along the road of our lives, as we experience 
defeat and despair and disappointment in our daily lives. Let us remember to welcome in the one who wants to walk on the road with us. May our hearts also be warmed by his company. And may our lives be ignited with passion and hope as we recognize his presence with us. May we live with hope and courage and joy, knowing that Jesus is alive and he is with us. So Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that it is so easy to miss you as we go about living our lives. It's so easy to focus our attention on other things and miss your presence that is right beside us. We are thankful for the reminder from your word today that you are always with us, that you are alive and that you are involved. So give us eyes, Lord, to see you. Give us hearts that are open to recognizing you. Help us, Lord, to expect and believe that you want to speak to us. Help us to dive into the practices of the church and to be involved in church life so that we might better connect ourselves with you. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk through the journey of our lives knowing that we are not alone and knowing that hopelessness and despair are not the emotions we have to live with. We pray, Lord, that we would know your joy and your power, your hope and your presence, in all that we face up to, because we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live in that way. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.